We're good. What's up, guys? So we are doing my first podcast, and the first guest that I have on is the fight dietitian, the fight dog, uh, Jordan Sullivan. So I know I've been on his uh, podcast and a few others, and people have always asked me stuff about um, my fighting and my dieting and stuff like that. But I did this podcast because I want to talk about uh, what I want to talk about, and I would rather get really good quality information from some really intelligent um, professional experts in their field and Jordy is one of those and I've never really asked him the questions that I want to talk about today and my general direction for this talk is more about uh, covering how to become a healthier athlete and a healthier fighter and and stop all the like detrimental uh, damage that we do to our bodies um, as a professional fighter because it's very like it's a very unexplored uh, sport, I guess you could say, right, Jordy? And um, a lot of information is just passed down through generations of different coaches and different fighters, and a lot of it has never been researched or like been proven. It's just like this worked for me, so this will work for you. But obviously, everybody is different. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about circadian uh, rhythms, and which is also known as the body clock, and how to potentially uh, use that to your advantage and, and, and you know, been a, oh, keep it more beneficial for your health. And then we're just going to sort of spiral off from there and see where we end up. So what's up, Jordy? Yeah, thanks for having us on. Quite well overdue, about time you started your own podcast. But yeah, yeah, it's a real cool topic. Like you said, especially within combat sports, it's such a young sport. I think when you look at other sports like football and, and basketball and hockey, they've been around for so long, so they've got so much science and everything behind it and millions and millions of dollars in institutes and academies to support them. But when it comes to yeah, yeah. MMA and combat sports, that's just not there. Yeah, it sucks. Um, it's because it's thought of as like human cockfighting and a lot of people don't want to support uh, you know, people beating the crap out of each other, I guess, which I can't see that angle, but now it's getting more scientific and it is definitely a beautiful sport. So hopefully we get more financial backing from governments, stuff like that. But let's start anyway. So we're going to talk about the body clock and the circadian rhythm and, you know, how different how it gets like disrupted during training. So I've had to write this all down because this is like way out of my area of expertise. That's why I have you on here. But um, I just want to talk about how your training times during the day can di- disrupt your circadian rhythm. So late sessions at night. Um, and changing your time and not eating at a regular pattern and stuff like that. So what I wanted to cover first was obviously you have an autonomic nervous system, right? You have your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous system. And depending on how late you train depends on which nervous system is activated, right, at night. And so ideally you want to go to bed with your parasympathetic nervous system activated so you can rest and digest and recover for the next day. But in order to do so, you need to go to bed at a certain time and you and get your eight hours sleep, which is insanely beneficial and so important. But you also need to have time to digest before you go to bed, right? So let's say I finish training at 8 or 8.30 p.m. at night. And I have an earlier session in the morning, okay? And so I want to eat my food. I want it to digest. I want to go parasympathetic and I want to go to sleep and wake up with my eight hours sleep. But this is very, very hard to do in the modern world. And the reason people train later is because a lot of people have to wait for uh, training partners to get to the gym that work normal jobs, et cetera. So do you think it is more beneficial, in your opinion, on this? A lot of people will eat. Uh, They finish their training. It's high intensity. They go home and they eat. Um, they They end up having showering. They go to bed. And they go to bed in a sympathetic state. And their body's not really digesting, right? all the blood's flowing somewhere else because they're still sympathetic. Would you prefer someone to go to bed later and potentially miss an hour's sleep and not quite get that complete sleep and potentially go parasympathetic and relax and really wind down? Or would you encourage them to go to bed earlier in a sympathetic state and just, yeah, see how you wake and feel up in the, see how you wake up and feel in the morning? Yeah, this is the fun thing about science, right? And I think this is the answer that not everyone likes and it depends. Like it depends what angle you're taking it from and we can talk about, we will, we'll go over circadian rhythms and the theory behind that and why certain approaches can be more beneficial. When you're talking about purely performance, right, you need to think about the demand of the workload. I think that's a big consideration. 
if you've got an athlete who say is training at night and they're doing what you guys do, which is a glycogen dependent activity, which means you use a lot of carbohydrates and say you deplete a lot of your muscle glycogen, you need to replace that if you've got another big session in the morning. So coming home and getting in that parasympathetic state and then putting that fuel back in is going to be advantageous to your performance the following morning. But that's when it comes into a lot of individual attention when say, hey, maybe the next morning you don't have that. And so we don't have to prioritize that. And we know overnight, you're going to use your liver glycogen just to keep your blood sugars regular over that overnight fast, that seven to eight hours or six hours, however many hours of sleep you get. We know that if you're going to do activity over 60 minutes or it's high intensity, you need to have that glycogen on board. So if you're already liver glycogen depleted, it makes sense for us to get some muscle glycogen in there. And there's been so many studies, time to exhaustion okay. studies that have shown that you're going to get a better performance if you have that glycogen in there. So when it comes to, okay, I've just come home from a late night training, do I eat or do I not? It all depends on what do you have the next day? What did you just do? Is it a priority for you to get that food in or is it a priority for you to get to bed and do you have the time to wake up early and get that food in? Right. I guess then the next step on that and like I guess what you want to talk about more is, okay, if you're doing that over the long term, are there other detrimental effects if you're going against, say, your your body's natural body clock. And I think if we to get into that, we've got to take like a couple steps back. And I think for everyone listening, you'll all be familiar with like circadian rhythms and everyone has heard the concept and everyone describes it as like a, a internal body clock is the best way to think about it. When you think about what determines that body clock, we have a part of our brain called the hypothalamus and there's a little part in there about 30, 40,000 neurons or so comprising our suprachiasmatic nucleus or SCN for short and that works on a light dark cycle so if you look outside everyone can see the sun it's not news not news to anyone that the sun goes up and sun goes down and that's happened for millions and millions of years right so it makes sense that our body that has evolved on this earth has gone in sync with that pattern right so that is pretty much what we call our central governor and to keep it short the whole theory behind optimal health and when to eat food is that we have this central governance in our brain, in our hypothalamus, in our SCN that works on this light dark cycle. And then so when there's light coming up, we should, certain things should happen in our body that gets us up and you see things like your serotonin will increase, cortisol will increase, and that'll usually happen in sync with the sun coming up. And then as the sun comes down, other things happen say melatonin increases and that gets us ready for bed and gets us sleepier, you know. Right. And then when we're talking about food, and I guess this is where the interesting thing comes, is that that's a central governing. In our body, pretty much most organs and most systems in our body have what we call peripheral clocks and they have peripheral timing. So say things like our pancreas, which releases insulin, which we need to digest glucose, which we were talking about before, which is important fuel, that's going to have its own body clock or peripheral clock and we know now that we're seeing a bit of research that that has this ideal movement throughout the day and maybe it's higher in the morning and then it kind of peaks down and then kind of dips up a bit at night and then comes back down and then when you look at that you can kind of rationally say okay well if insulin is this peripheral clock and it's all tying into this sync with this nice natural pattern that we're meant to be following if i eat opposite to that that pattern it's probably not good for my body and it's probably not good. I'm not getting an ideal response. And this is the cool thing about science. And I think especially in the in the field that I'm in with performance is you're trying to tie all these things together. It's like, okay, so I can be aware that we've got this body clock and, you know, you need to be doing these things and sleeping and getting in your parasympathetic and getting your eight hours. But then we also got to lay on top of that, okay, I need you to get this fuel in and I need you to fuel up properly for training. So I think yeah. to preface the conversation, I think no matter who you talk to, everyone looks at things from like their own perspective, right? Like I'm always going to look at things from a performance nutrition perspective. Yeah. You look up, you talk to a circadian biologist, they'll probably give you more of a circadian biology perspective. You talk to a neuroscience. So it's an interesting topic, but I think, yeah, let's just shoot some questions. And I think there's, there's a lot of good learning to be had from athletes by kind of understanding these central and peripheral clocks a bit more. All right. Okay. So let's, I'll use myself for an example. So sometimes when I finish training later and for instance, it's VO2 max. So you always fuel us like after that, you know, it's heavy and it's long. So you give us a big feed, but sometimes I have that food and 
like it's time for me to go to bed because the next day I have to get up like not too early. But if I don't go to bed at like 10 ish, I'm not going to get my eight hours because I know it takes me a bit to wind down. But the thing is, I eat all that food and I'm lying there and I'm like, oh, and I feel a bit full and it messes with my breathing. It like start, I start to get a bit congested and like I can't sort of like relax. Would you like recommend having a ton of food before that VO2 max session that would potentially power me through that and maybe? have a smaller meal after to run me through to the next morning or do you still recommend eating that bigger meal and feeling like that and just you know maybe sacrificing a bit of sleep or would you like maybe swap those uh that bigger meal for like liquid cal- calories if you made a shake or something so you can go to bed like a little bit i don't know you, you, you'll still be full but you feel empty quicker yeah yeah i think again <laughs> personal preference but yeah whatever is going to meet the demands of fueling for that athlete is going to be best so say if you've got your your vo2 on wednesday and then you're going into a big session thursday morning your there's a certain amount of muscle glycogen that your body will need to have to be saturated like for you guys it's going to be between five six hundred grams right so that's 500 to 600 grams of carbohydrates if we want you to be completely glycogen saturated now you don't yeah. absolutely need to be glycogen saturated because you might not be doing activity that's going to glycogen deplete you. But the thing is, is like when you're talking about recreational athletes or guys that aren't going that hard, they're probably not going to need all of that energy. So they don't deplete it all. They'll probably finish their session and still have 60% of that glycogen. So they only need to put in like a small meal. Anyone that's trained with you guys or gone to your gym, it's not exactly the most chilled out environment. It's very balls to the wall it's very intense you guys are do and it's long duration Scientific. yeah you guys it's a long duration you guys are going for hours on end i'm very confident if we did biopsy studies on you guys you guys would be getting close to glycogen saturation almost every every one of those big sessions so if you're yeah. what we need to do then is make sure you go into that session with that glycogen stocked up you're going to burn it if you have that big session again it's a priority yeah. from a performance perspective and a recovery perspective you need to get that back in. You need to get that so, back in. So the fact that you know that we chase like a high with a high. Yeah. So Wednesday night high and long with a Thursday morning high. What would you, how would you fuel us? So you need to get that in before, during, if you can stomach it and afterwards. And then yeah. if the digestion is a big issue, because sleep, sleep underpins everything, right? You need to get in and get that yeah. sleep. Liquid calories, things that are going to be more easily digested are going to be more beneficial. But again, like if you're not doing high and high, if you've got a high and low, you can strategically keep muscle glycogen lower. And, and, and I'm sure yeah. if you talk to that, that, that Olympic coach that you get going on, like a like a train low, compete high strategy is a strategy lots of endurance athletes use where they'll, they'll train in like a lower glycogen state to get more favorable fat adaptation and to get more, they call right. it mitochondrial biogenesis, where it increases your ability to use fat. And that's great for you know, endurance and it's good for combat athletes as well. But again, it's got to be specific and you can't be sacrificing your performance for that adaptation. So it doesn't make sense to do that when you're going high to high. If you've got a low session, for sure, I'd go quake. You don't need to top all that glycogen back up. Just go home, right. put what's comfortable in and then do that one. You'll probably get that that favorable fat adaptation anyway in the second session in the next morning. And and do you think uh, if you're regularly doing that, like let's say I've been doing that for years, which we have, do you think can the body adapt so that their circadian rhythm will adjust so that it's not really a problem that we're training that late at night? Or can our body adapt, like can its digestion adapt? I'm not sure if you know or not, so that it knows that we are rushing that period because the body does crazy shit. It knows we're trying to rush the food and go past sympathetic and then go to bed. Can it compact that all shorter or does it just need that stock standard time of let's say two hours to digest? Yeah. Well, like I guess when it comes back to the circadian rhythm, it's always going to adapt. And I think we all have an understanding of that if you've ever traveled, like if you've ever even yeah. traveled internationally over international lines. But I think there's this other thing called like social jet lag when you throw your circadian rhythm out on the over the weekend. If you go out on a right, Saturday right, night, yeah. like you technically delay – your central circadian rhythms and you get a bit of misalignment but it only takes a little bit of time to get it all back in i think you can talk right. to the cows come home about you know central and peripheral alignment and everything else but at the end of the day all of the research kind of points that routine is really important like yes you've got your sleep dark like your light dark cycle and you've got your sleep wake cycle and that's really important 
you're never going to be able to change the light dark cycle. You can do things to make it more favorable with like blue light blockers and, and things like that and getting natural light at yeah. certain times when you wake up. But what you what is going to be most beneficial for you is routine. And we see that when you're yeah. eating and you see that when people do this with studies is that when you have routine with people, you do, you see them get better glucose tolerance. You see them get better insulin sensitivity. It's when you throw people completely out of their routine, that's when you see, okay, they eat a meal and then postprandial glucose goes through the roof. So having that set routine, like you said, your body's a crazy thing, it'll adjust. And that's like, you've quite literally yeah. got genes in these peripheral circadian organs that are going to adjust to that. And it's going to make that new routine and make that new rhythm if you're consistent enough with it. The worst thing that happens and this the best example of throwing this completely out, like throwing the, the, what is it? The saying, throwing the kitchen out with the baby in it or whatever it is, the fasting with the baby in it, whatever. <laughs> the fuck you just yeah, that what, whatever, whatever that saying is. The best <laughs> one is like shift that. workers. You ever seen shift workers? They're, they're, they're the most, like that's a whole topic on itself, but shift workers, nurses that work crazy shifts, yeah. Yeah. they consistently swap between night shift and day shift and never have consistent rhythms. Things yeah, like yeah. this would it is very, very difficult to do. And this is when it gets really disrupted there. It's so much higher risk of like metabolic syndrome. It's very difficult yeah. to lose weight with them because even though they're eating the same amount of calories, like their their feeding windows are all out of whack. They, you never get these central central patterns or peripheral patterns to reinforce each other. So you never get this like really solid routine and it's quite disastrous for their body. Yeah. So if the if the people feel like they're not really I don't know, adapting or they just always feel the same, like they feel tired or they feel full. Um, what, what I guess what would you recommend for them? Would you recommend to get a little less food and get them, get more sleep or get more food and get a little less sleep? Because then you start to like dig into playing with like the recovery debt, right? Because you need a certain amount of calories. Recovery, everyone thinks recovery is like, or well, a lot of people think recovery is like saunas, massage stretching all that stuff but like a huge amount of recovery obviously is enough calories yeah because the calories drives uh, recovery and also sleep so where where do you juggle that like calories or sleep well sleep is king i think sleep is going to be hugely beneficial i think sleep is a consistent thing right and you need it when it comes to your nutrition you've got a bit more flex with it because like i said your body is a very robust thing if you're very uncomfortable eating that amount of carbohydrates, unless you're pushing the absolute upper limits, which most athletes aren't, your gut will adapt to it. Your gut will get yeah. better at digesting carbohydrates. So again, if you're consistent, it'll get better over time. Whereas if you're constantly getting a lack of sleep, you're just constantly going into a further sleep deprivated state, which is going to have a continual negative effect on every other aspect of your performance and your recovery. So I think initially, if you can set that sleep and get consistent sleep, that's probably going to be more important because you've got that more flexibility within your nutrition and you can play around with it. You don't necessarily have to get all those carbohydrates after training. Play around with getting them in beforehand, getting them during even, getting those intra-carbohydrates so you know that when you're finishing exercise, you're not in a completely depleted state. You haven't gone that hard. Yeah. So. I would say, yes, yeah, sleep probably gets the priority because you've got more flexibility with your nutrition. Okay. Deep. Went kind of deep there. <laughs> Not going to lie. I got a little bit lost. But uh, all right, cool. So let's like move on and let's just talk about uh, general health because this is like a massive thing um, that I that I think is important with fighting. I'm sure obviously, you do as well, is like all year round dieting or not even dieting, just eating cleaner, like to get away from this fl ruthless fluctuation that a lot of fighters have where they do this ruthless diet for eight eight or so weeks, they do their weight cut, they drop all this weight and then they make weight and they just go, just balloon up, you know, like Ricky Haddon, for example. Mm. I just want your <laughs> input and advice for younger fighters or even like older professional fighters now that are still stuck in those ways because I used to do that. I used to, you know, just eat shit. All year round, I used to walk around like 84 or so kilo, 85 or so kilo and uh, balloon up after each weight cut. Yeah. Well, like I think this is probably like we were saying off air, I personally myself and a lot of my colleagues think this is the biggest problem in combat sports, not weight cutting. It's weight yeah. cycling in between fights. And the reason that we say that, 
and we did a post about this the other day. I don't know if you saw it about the Minnesota starvation experiment. It's a very, uh, very, very cool. I don't follow you. Yeah, it's a very cool um, <laughs> experiment that they did in World War One. Ansel Keys did it to figure out what the human response is to starvation because that's essentially what you guys are doing to yourself, right? Like you're dropping. It's not normal. Normal people don't drop between ah, 15 no, to 20% yeah, but, of their body yeah. weight in eight weeks time that's not a normal thing so like what they did yeah. was prisoners of war they looked at them and they said what's going on physiologically metabolically with these guys and they found all of these crazy things essentially you can go read the paper i'll cut to the good stuff is that these guys went into an extreme like food obsessed state because they were so malnourished they had all these metabolic changes like down regulating metabolic um, systems they down regulated yeah. certain hormones and they were obsessed about food 24 7 just took over their mind and so when they right. came out, they saw this, they call it rebound hyperphagia. And you get what hyperphagia is, the fancy word for overeating. And so everyone, they say you go into this calorie debt, like you go into a debt with your body. So you say, yep. we have studies with actual combat sport athletes where research looked at this. Say you go into 110,000 calorie debt to your body in an eight-week camp. So when you wow. finish that camp, your, wow. your body goes, man, I need 110,000 calories. So what do you do? No wonder everyone goes <laughs> and binges and like everyone does it. Yeah, and yeah. people always say, oh, what like reverse diet, blah, 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 diet. That's great in theory. But when you're in 110,000 calorie debt, yeah. fuck off with your <laughs> reverse diet. Like it's not, it's, I, it's I, not happening. It's not happening. I, it takes all my willpower not to, even like now, not to, to blow exactly. up mess up after each fight. Like, man, it takes me some. But the thing out. is. Lucky we go to quarantine. Yeah. The thing is with it is when you do that drastic cut down, You've got all that metabolic issues to deal with. And then when you come back up, what they find, what they found in Ansel Key studies way back in, you know, 1916, 17, whenever they did it. And now that we're seeing again, now that we're looking at it, is when you come back up, your body composition changes. You might go back yeah. to the same weight, but you've lost muscle and you've put on more fat. Or you've gone to a higher weight and you've got more fat. And now you've got like yeah, less right. and you've got less insulin sensitivity. And you've got these issues that the first couple of times it might not be that bad but you keep doing it over and over again, you get to your fourth, fifth, sixth fight and all of a sudden you're heavier and your hormones are all messed up and your metabolism's all shot and it gets yeah, harder yeah. and harder to cut weight. And then people go, oh, I'm just, I'm just aging. It's just like, this is just natural. This is what happened. I can't make the weight. It goes, no, you've just cooked your metabolism too many times, right. change your body composition. So that I think is a far, far bigger issue than actually cutting weight in combat sports because like, I have an entire job where my entire job and I have a whole team and I have scientists all around the world where we focus just on weight cutting. And I think we can very safely cut weight with people, 10% of their weight, very easily do it. What we don't quite understand is how do we manage these huge dips? How do we manage yeah. these dips? And even like when, say, if we've got to lose a bunch of weight, what do we do during camp? Do we give them diet breaks? Do we give them refeeds? Do we do things to help mitigate these problems? And then yeah. like we can talk about all of those things. But you know what the easiest solution is to it? Just don't do it. Don't do these crazy yeah. cuts. Don't do these. Do you know crazy what the second easiest solution is? Learn how learn how to cook well. Yeah, yeah. Don't eat out. I'm not even kidding, bro. Yeah, yeah don't learn eat how out. to cook don't really well. But yeah. that's the thing. Right? If you learn how to cook well and cook uh, clean and make it taste really good, which is what I <laughs> I spend a lot of my time doing. That's why I smoke so much meat. Uh, it makes a huge difference, man. Yeah. Difference, man. Like never eat out anymore. But you're a good example really of it. Do. Like you're a great example of this. I don't know if we're if we're meant to disclose info, personal info on your podcast. I was a terrible example. But like now this, I'm is, a good this is the thing that, is that when I first worked with you, you were like that. Like remember, you were eating that first camp to for your debut at Melbourne. You're on eighteen hundred calories. That is ridiculous. That, that is camp. ridiculous. That no, great camp. no person over the age of twelve years old should be on eighteen hundred <laughs> calories. That's so ridiculous. Your infant uh, child should be on more calories than that. So it's like there's no way you should. But we had to do that because metabolically, that's the deficit we had to get in to allow you to lose weight. But then you can see, yeah. okay, when you do it properly and you build your metabolism back up and then you don't do these drastic weight cuts where your weight is far more manageable now and you're at all you have to do to diet down to get to that 10% range where we know we can just manip – you're not manipulating yeah. fat, you're manipulating water. You just need to go a little bit to get there. So you're not doing these drastic, drastic diets. So you're not getting this metabolic damage, which in the long term means you're managing your health, your hormonal health, your metabolic health, your physical, your mental health. You're managing right. that so much better. And like, well, I feel I feel better than I ever have now. And for like people that are listening, for uh, Jordy's debut with me, which he loved, 
It was, uh, I came down from 84 kilo to 70 on 1800 calories, pretty much the entire camp. It was a terrible time. And now I eat, uh, every day I probably eat about 4,000 calories. Uh, that's probably like a, a standard day. Sometimes a few more and I'm just walking around just over 80 kilo. Yeah. So it, uh, it took a little bit of work, but now life's way better than what it was back then. And that was just from not reverse dieting or anything. That was just from eating clean and working out regularly and just uh, not being a complete piece of shit after every fight and blowing up. Yeah, and that's the thing now is like your your normal metabolism now, you're like 4,000, 4,200. That means like when we need to cut weight, you just need to go to 3,500. And if you compare yeah. like what 3,500 calories looks like compares to the 1,800 calories, like no wonder you were so yeah. grumpy and angry all the time. Like <laughs> what if you, literally that's, that's so little calories. But that's the reality for so many fighters, right? And it's like yeah. that's, the, that's the foundation. Well, I think it's the foundation why we get in such a rut. And then I think it just it's all amplified when we look at the weight cutting because you see the yeah. end yeah. product of all of that. So everyone blames weight cutting. I don't think weight cutting is that crazy like, you you want you and Selby and the well, it's guys. Pretty, it's pretty yeah. pretty easy. Yeah. Like yeah. you guys will lose five. You can lose five, six, seven percent of your body weight in a tough training that you go for a couple. Of, you go for a bike ride for a few hours in the summer. You'll lose that yeah. amount of weight and you'll still be fine. Like there's marathon. Like Gabrielle Celesi, one of the best marathon runners in the world, went for the marathon world record. Just missed it in Dubai. And he lost 10% of his body weight doing it, which is what a weight cut. And he was performing at the highest level. So your body can very yeah. easily do that. But what your body doesn't like is when you just absolutely thrash it on 800 calories while putting it through this brutal training camp yeah. for eight to 10 weeks. Yeah. And then you do that three times a year for five years. Your body doesn't like that stuff. Yeah, it doesn't like those massive lifts and in intensity either. Like if you finish fights and... Uh... What me and you were saying before off air about how if you are if you stay fit and pretty healthy and you're a professional athlete, you can just dip into the red zone a couple of times a week and you maintain pretty good uh, VO2 max and pretty good conditioning as well versus like finishing the fight and doing shit all and just getting heavy and getting unfit and you'll go back into those ruthless intensities of training and also into that ruthless diet. It's just the worst time ever. Like you do not, it's just eight weeks of your life that you don't really enjoy. Yeah. You know what I always think is like, there's obviously exceptions to the rule i think like we all know like we both know like a pretty good exception <laughs> to the rule like because carlos and Ezra yeah like that's, that's, that's the thing is like yeah. most things in biology exist on a bell curve and so that means there's always yeah. going to be people at the other end but for the the bulk majority of people that's the biggest yeah. issue yeah. that's the big ticket item is what they do around the year it's probably not weight cutting you probably got that down pat you're just a complete yeah, idiot yeah. when it comes to all these other things and yeah you know, but also like like people israel is he's just a freak right in every nature of the word but he's also not super overweight for his no. uh weight category right like he comes into fight week at like 90 kilo ish mm. so he just has to lose six kilo to to make weight off a 90 kg man that's very easy for him like he wakes up uh with like a kg to lose and he always feels great and he just gains like oh he i think he weighed at like one one eighty three and a half no, oh. no, before the fight. Oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. He, yeah. He, he, he weighed heavy. not much, right? And he just he creamed Vittori. And Vittori was like over 200 pounds. Like, yeah, yeah. But as he was like, obviously just felt good, natural, didn't cut too much. And yeah, man. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely a, a trend that I'm starting to see nowadays. And maybe it's because you guys are like a bit more vocal and these conversations are happening a bit more. As I'm definitely seeing a lot of fighters are moving away from that thought process of like, weight cutting is this advantage that I can have. And I think that's it's partly, definitely not. Yeah, partly due to like what you're talking about is they're switching on so much. Like you talking about circadian rhythms and like how can I optimize this or breath work or how do I improve my recovery and my sleep? Like they're things that will yeah. give you a legit advantage when you go to fight. Weight cutting kind of, I think people are figuring out like, oh crap, we put so many eggs in this basket and it's probably not that good of a return. How about we put those eggs in all these other baskets instead and I just won't do it as bad. Yeah, 100%. Just don't blow up. Live a little bit healthier. Learn to cook. And if you're uh, if you're sort of wondering to yourself like, oh, do I eat enough calories or like do I, do, do I eat too little, do I eat too much? You should just uh, pay for someone to help you. <laughs> That's like the, the best bit of advice I could give someone is like pay for somebody like you or like another dietitian or whoever, whoever you guys know 
and uh, make sure they're qualified also in this area because it's a very niche specific sport. Like a lot of people say they, I don't know, I can't think of the phrase what they are. They say they know what they're doing in here, but they really don't. They're just completely bluffing it. And it's a very uh, dangerous sport to act like you know what you're doing in and not actually know what you're doing because you're going to hurt some people. So that's why I use Geordie because him and his team, they do a lot of research. They Geordie tests everything by himself. I'm always seeing his Instagram. He's always in the bath, huffing away, doing like big weight beat cuts your numbers, and himself up. He, you definitely don't beat my numbers. <laughs> I do an hour at the end of the weight yeah, cut. You do an day. hour <laughs> in the middle of your camp. You're you're fine. You're our puss. But um, yeah, that invest in yourself is is my advice. Uh, when you get money after fights, you know. Of course, you're going to go treat yourself, and maybe buy some shoes or like, you know, I don't know, whatever the fuck you like, buy whatever you like, but also invest that money back into you. And like a great video to watch is George St. Pierre has one on YouTube and it says mm-hmm. how I spent my first million dollars. I love that video. Uh, he made a million dollars and he invested a quarter of a million into himself training, flying around. He went to, you know, New York He'd go train with Danny Hero, go to Brazil. Or I remember he came to Thailand when I was there and trained over there for his Muay Thai, like he really spent a lot investing in himself and he didn't spend a lot on, on dumb stuff. Like I know he bought his parents $20,000 cars, just reliable, good cars. And like, he's a very, it's a good, it's a good uh, YouTube video. Actually, I'm going to link it in this. It's really, really good. Yeah. It's funny. Hey, with athletes. And that's something that I find is that I think they get like really caught up in a lot of things that probably they want shortcuts to getting these good results. Like they'll buy, yeah. I don't know, the latest running shoes or they'll buy like gloves or whatever, all these things that, yeah, they, they have their place, but all these big ticket items like your nutrition, your sleep, your recovery, your mental, which yeah. I think your mental is probably 95% of it is like probably going to be huge things. A lot of people won't even consider that or they'll look at it and be like, oh, no, I don't want to spend it. But then you'll go out yeah. and buy like heaps of Uber Eats or you'll buy like, you know, other stupid stuff that you don't need. Imagine if you just reinvest and that's like the common yep. theme with all my top level athletes is they're just like they're great investors whether they realize it or not they're not like bitcoin millionaires like a couple of them have a lot of bitcoin but like but like they I'm invest sure. they like, Name them. They, like Name them. <laughs> they like invest in themselves right like and that's the best investment yeah. they'll ever make yeah that's true so if you think about it like this i mean my sports psychologist a guy called dave neath who i'm also going to get on this uh very soon he said to me once how much time do I spend each week training? How much time do I spend each week doing recovery? And then how much time do I spend each week on my mind? And I was like, I spend like 30 hours a week training, 10 hours a week doing recovery. And then I was like, oh shit, I don't spend any time on my mind. And then now I do. And my fights show that like I've been in some pretty dark, deep, dark places in my fights and I always push through. And a lot of that is to do with my mental side of things that I've learned from him and a lot of breath work that I learned from another Dave. So yeah, you need to definitely invest back in yourself. Yeah. And I would almost add to that is that I find this a lot because I see this with like a lot of amateurs or young people. And there's probably a bunch of them listening to this where they might like look at someone like you or look at Israel and they'll be like, man, I could never do what they do. They've got something that like I'll just no. never have and it's like no like they're just normal humans yeah. like like you and me they have the same 24 hours they have you know, some people might have a few more resources but they've just chosen to spend their resources discovering and learning and enhancing very particular things like your breath work like your mental state like your nutrition like your sleep and like if anyone wants to do that they can and that's one of the things that kind of I feel like is a massive misconception in this area is like oh it's just so unattainable I can't do it it's like yeah you can do it. I definitely, you definitely can. You definitely can. You're right. Uh, we got deep, and that was good. I've got, I've actually got some questions for you as well from people from my Instagram. Well, these that are I'm always good. <laughs> That's no, nah, they're all they're all pretty good. There's some there's some silly ones in there as well. But the first one, it says top supplements for recovery, and I was actually just reading a paper about uh just avoiding supplements and getting like as much as you of it as you can out of your food and i know a big one that people always ask about is bcaas and amino acids which you hate so i'm gonna let you get i'm gonna let you get into that but yeah 
top supplements if there are any that you recommend and if you don't recommend them what do you recommend yeah and keep in mind i'll pref i always preface this nowadays is like this is coming from a guy that has dumped way too much money into owning a supplement company i like to say <laughs> you don't need supplements i think oh sorry the trainer yeah i was sorry, gonna say the shout supplement, the supplement you yeah. guys need is like, a trainer. that's the thing right like coming from someone who owns a supplement company is like wasted two houses <laughs> on it it's just like you don't nec- you don't need it if you've got a great diet you don't need it and it's just but there are certain things where i think it'll make your life way easier. I think there's there's supplements yeah. for convenience. And I think the top one for that is like a protein powder because like, unless you love cooking, for sure. But if you're busy and you like work a full-time job, then a like whey protein powder is excellent. BCAAs, I don't love. I think for females at certain stages of their menstrual cycle, if you want to go that deep, you can probably utilize them. For everyone else who eats enough protein in the diet, has a good whey protein, I describe it like you jumping into a pool grabbing a bucket and then getting a bucket of water and putting it on your head with the intention of getting wetter. Like it just doesn't work. You've got enough already in your diet. It's just don't waste your money on them. The other thing, protein bars, protein bars. Yeah. Convenience. Why not? But like always food first. And I think if you want performance supplements, the ones we always say creatine, creatine, not just for performance. I like people taking it for, cause there's a lot of mental and um, neurocognitive uh, benefits to it. Like I get my parents to take it. Everyone I know pretty much always preach, take creatine. Beta alanine, I think, is useful if you do like a pretty intense sport for endurance wise. Um, electrolytes, I, I think, that. are useful if you are a sweaty person. Like everyone knows that gym that is person in the gym that just walks around in puddles. If you are that person, you're probably yeah. losing a lot of electrolytes. You should take one. Other people don't need them. You're not that big of a salty sweater. You don't, probably don't need them. The other thing that I would say is probably useful as the protein, protein, beta alanine, creatine, a multivitamin if you do like what we do and you're in a calorie deficit for a sustained period just to make sure you're covering all bases. And then vitamin D, not so much for you and me, but like our North American friends that live in that and I've been there and where it's horrible, where it's like eight months of your life is just in darkness. You need vitamin D because vitamin D is like so much more of a hormone than it is a vitamin. And it just, if you it's linked to so many other things, not just performance, but like depression, mood states, get vitamin D. In terms of recovery, I think there's a, a lot of room for omegas, like omega-3s are very, very good for inflammation. And then yeah. curcumin is probably the other one that I would recommend if um, for inflammation. Outside of that, there's not a lot of sups that I, I, I put my hat on, but everything I just said then- Choose food. Yeah, everything I Choose just said food, then right? you can get with a good diet. And I think if you eat heaps of plants, you get good protein, yeah. whether that's from- the ass of a cow or from something you grow in your garden doesn't matter just get heaps of it and then you eat lots of colors you're probably going to do pretty well and also i feel like when you uh, start to delve into like protein bars and stuff like that it's like a quick fix and you tend to get hungry quite quickly after and that sort of causes you to overeat even though those, pro- those protein bars are quite high calorie and then you get hungry again later so you eat again so you end up overeating eating too many calories especially like us if you have to operate in a deficit and you start to not drop weight because you're eating those bars and you're like, oh, I need to eat again because I'm hungry. I find that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, yeah. Like someone's, carry on, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, I think it's important, right? Because it's like appetite as well. And like yeah, the best thing you can eat do for your appetite food. Yeah, that is satiating high fiber, high protein foods, which is not a protein bar that has a million other weird fillers and everything else in there. Someone wrote nutrition role and overtraining. So I'm assuming they mean uh, if you've overtrained, do you, should you pump more calories into yourselves? I'm, I'm assuming you should uh, probably rest. Yeah, yeah. And I guess like yeah. on top of that, if you're overtrained, you should rest. And then if you're taking a rest day, don't cut your calories because if you are overtrained and let's just say your muscle's breaking down and like your your muscle balance is like a, it's like a break in a car, break in a car accelerator. It's always going to be going and you want it to just – be consistent and or if you want to be putting on muscle you got to be pumping more calories more protein in there as athletes you want to maintain your muscle and you do that by having adequate protein and adequate calories so yeah definitely and i think if you want to talk about things like inflammation then your omegas whether that's in food supplements curcumin and then hydration super super important for recovery i like this one define optimal nutrition for the everyday person in 30 seconds or less. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about it. I already got it. The diet uh, the diet that is most optimal, the diet that is most optimal for you is the diet that you can stick to. 
<laughs> All right, to like four seconds. Boom. How can you learn to do S and C slash nutrition for yourself without having to pay for services? Uh, YouTube will get you so far. Hey, do a lot of reading yeah. and do a lot of reading and prepare to do a lot of trial and error. Get fat, get skinny, yeah. get hungry. That, that that's why I you reckon. Pay. I reckon. I reckon the best advice would be investing in yourself, get a bit of job, and spend more money on yourself. Yeah, exactly. This well, yeah. that's why you pay someone. This is what I tell people. Everything I yeah. know. I obviously learned. So the information's out there. Like I don't I don't know anything that's like brand spanking new that hasn't been discovered in the universe. The reason like you would come to me to get these answers is because you're saving time and you're saving the time of going around doing all that own research. So like, yeah, if you if you're gonna do it yourself, just be prepared to go down a lot of rabbit holes and get very confused yeah. and frustrated and whatnot. Definitely, definitely pay. Definitely pay for someone that is qualified and recommended. Um you're just going to get results faster. Yeah. Don't don't be cheap. Yeah. Okay. Opinions on fruit smoothies. Is it okay to eat fruit as well in the day when training? Yeah. Fruit is um gets demonized because of its sugar content and there's this weird thing about fructose, but to be honest, it's a load of bollocks. Like if you've got – if maybe the only time you would really consider that if you've got diabetes and even then if you've got diabetes that you aren't managing well because like diabetics should be eating fruit. But yeah, fruit smoothies are fine. Don't demonize fruit. I'd rather you eat fruit than your protein bar that has 250 all calories right. and all that other weird stuff. How much trial and error did you go through to perfect your system of weight cutting? Heaps. That's a good question. Heaps. I should get, I should get up. <laughs> There's athletes that I won't let talk about it. I haven't got so close to getting an NDA out, but my early weight cuts, Jesus, I've put some people through some hell. Yeah, my first few clients were bad. But that was, I think, mostly because I was – taking information from other people that probably I shouldn't have been taking information from, but yeah. lots of trial and error. But um, luckily now it, it, it's a lot more smoothed out. How much does food affect mood and mood affect fight performance? Well, I can tell you a lot. Yeah, I was going to say I'll mental. I'll let Quake yeah. answer the back end of that, but yeah, a lot. Um, heaps, heaps and heaps and heaps. There's a really cool, I won't go into it too much, but just Google food and mood center Monash university and they literally have an entire department dedicated to researching how food influences your mood. And I'll give you the short answer, a lot. <laughs> What's the correct diet and exercise to get a ripped body like Jordan Sullivan? Um, lots, <laughs> lots of not listening to your own your own advice, uh, oh, not listening yeah. to your physio and overtraining. Um, no, whatever. Lot, lots of people are obsessed with getting ripped, but some people like the harsh reality is, is that you'll just never get like that. It's like it's yeah, genetics. Yeah. You just never get yeah. like that. Or for you to get like that, you have to push yourself to a point where it's just like deleterious to other points of your health. So I don't know. You can get ripped if you want. Go do bodybuilding. Talk to a bodybuilding coach. They'll get you there. Get on the and they'll, give, they'll give you an eating disorder at the same time. Tips on potassium intake during fight week and for weight cuts. Plus, plus when rehydrating. Um, I don't focus on potassium in fight week because I understand the rationale, but I don't think as an electrolyte, it's something you need to worry about too much. Like sodium is key when it comes general potassium. If you want in food, go eat some bananas, go eat some apricots. Um, what was the second part of that question? Um, tips on potassium intake during fight week for your weight cut and also when rehydrating. Um, yeah, to be honest, I don't really focus too much on potassium. Sodium is key. When it comes to electrolytes, sodium is key. I understand and I know, think I know the article you read about that, but yeah, sodium is key. Okay, last one. How important are probiotics and a healthy gut microbiome for athletes? Yeah, super important. I think we know now for so many aspects, even going back to that circadian rhythm, what we were talking about, we're finding now one of the biggest peripheral um alignment centers or uh, peripheral clocks that we have is your gut biome and then every time that you eat it's like a, it's sending a signal through your um, gut biome but we know that again you can go back to monash uni the food and mood center talk about this a lot like the gut brain axis and the influence that has on you know mood states depression um, anxiety yeah. things like that super super important in terms of performance we see performance definitely so because it's how you absorb your food right like if you've got shot gut bacteria and you're not getting the most out of your food, how do you expect to get a good performance? So I think taking care of your gut bacteria is super important. Whether you need to take pre or probiotics, 
every every gut health expert I've ever spoken to always comes back with the same thing. There's no set diet or no supplement protocol that's going to get you the best other yeah. than eating lots and lots of plants and making sure they're very, very colorful and trying to hit every single eat, color of the rainbow. Eat fermented foods, yeah. yeah. Eat fermented foods for your gut as well, like kimchi, yeah. sauerkraut. There's a good uh, little talk on the Huberman podcast at an hour and five minutes. Uh, I think it's how to optimize your body and health. Uh, he talks about fermented food for a little bit there. So that's a good one to jump on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything fermented, anything colorful, it's all good. But then again, like everything in nutrition, all comes back down to that same recommendation. Good good food, lots of plants, lots of colors, good protein throughout the day. Minimize the processed crap. Man, I'm going to wrap it up there. That's 45 minutes. We thought we were going to do it in 30, but I think that's impossible. So I'm definitely going to make these podcasts 45 minutes. But that was awesome, and that was a lot of good information, Jordi, and I hope that helps a lot of upcoming and currently professional fighters because, uh, you know, people have a lot of questions out there and sometimes they don't know where or who to ask. So hopefully this has helped a lot of people. So cheers for coming on. You are the Virgin Podcast. So that's cool. I just need you to do one thing, and that is stick your right hand up like this with your finger. I was going to say. It's a legend. Look at this. I can't believe I have to look at that every day. Yeah. I have to look legend. at this every day. Very uh, coffee on it. Uh, yeah. But we'll get you back on in the future. We might be seeing each other sooner rather than later. But we'll have a talk about that. Yeah. Easy. Is anything else to add? Obviously, I'm going to put all Geordie's uh, links to his social media and stuff like that and his train aid, his supplement in this podcast so you guys can get at that and flood him with questions, you know, if he'll send you guys uh, free diets and stuff if you get get him in the uh, next five minutes. Yeah, done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, shot, Jordy. Easy.